Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we continue our introduction to the book of Daniel in Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 through 6. This is the conclusion of our two-part study. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudi, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushai, into Baruch, saying, Take in thine hand the roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. So they're taking this roll that it, Jeremiah's words has been written down uh, on, and they're going to take it to the king. Verse 15 says, And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Baruch uh, read it in their ears. Now it came to pass, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and other, and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go, hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. Now, are you getting a sense of the... This is like a drama. Dun, 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 dun. They've... They're going into hiding now. Jeremiah and Baruch. In verse 21, so the, uh, so the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll. And he took it out of Elishama, or Elishama, or Elishama, the scribe's chamber. I've heard it pronounced Elishama. And Jehudi read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. Now remember, this is the word of God we're dealing with here. Okay, verse 23, And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. But the king commanded Jeremiel, the son of Hamalek, and Sarai, the son of Israel, and the Shalomiah, the son of Abdil, to take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. And thou shalt say... A to Jehoiakim king of Judah thus saith the Lord thou hast burned this roll saying why hast thou written therein saying the king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat and in the night to the frost. So God is saying, your days are numbered. You're done. And the king of Babylon is going to come down and destroy this place. That's what we're reading in Daniel. We're reading the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecies. Ain't that awesome? You going to go to 32? Yeah, where did I leave off? 30? And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them. But they hearkened not. 
then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. All God's people say amen. amen. That's the account. I remember when uh, one of the people that was here for the last study was Jody Jose. And when we were studying this, she had heard a couple other people teach it, but it was she had to get the DVDs or whatever, the videos. And she came up afterward and she said, I've never dreamed I'd be in a church that would really study the Bible like this. <laughs> and I have to say, that's how I feel. You know, uh, it would be, you know, just a, me studying by myself. But I got you guys. Amen. And it's great Amen. to have people who want to study the Word of God. You just learn something. I'm telling you, people have been going to church for decades and they've never heard this taught, what we're studying right now. It's awesome. Now, Herbert Lockyer says this, in this is his own quote, and this, this is going to tie it into where we live today. Look what he says. Others have tried to use Jehoiakim's pen knife. When the Bible was first printed in England, the Romish, that's Roman Catholic, bishops and priests bought up all the Bibles they could find and made bonfires of them. The printers used the money to provide ten presses where there had only been one, and the Bibles in the land increased tenfold. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> Take that. Much to the chagrin of the priests who found that bonfires could not burn the instructable Word of God. Amen. That's the same thing Jehoiakim found out. You can burn the pages. You cannot destroy the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Unbelieving scholars attacked Daniel's authorship in an attempt to get rid of this book. So they try to say Daniel didn't actually write it. But the author of the book of Daniel is who? Daniel. Daniel <laughs> according to Jesus. Not just because the book says so in the Bible, which is good enough for me. When I look at the book of Hebrews and it says the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, I don't give a flip what your commentaries say. I believe Paul wrote it. And the same thing with Daniel. But we have the testimony of Jesus. He's the divine author, but he cites the human author in Mark 13, 14. Jesus said, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Of course, there's much more to that. I'm citing that one verse to show Jesus says Daniel wrote. There's only one place in the Bible you find this reference to the abomination of desolation up to this point when Jesus is talking. It's mentioned later by Paul after Jesus crucified, buried, risen, and ascends. At this point, there's only one book on the planet with that information. And Jesus says, Daniel wrote it. Amen. Who wrote the book of Daniel? Daniel. You bunch of simpletons. Yeah. If you really were scholarly, you wouldn't believe that. That's what they say. So what do the scholars and the scribes do? They put out Bibles where it says this. The NIV says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Um. Now some of you might be falling asleep because you worked hard today. <laughs> but look real close there. Huh? Hey? No. Listen for the missing note. That's in the King James Version. Jesus says Daniel was the one who spoke it. In the NIV, there's nothing but the marks of the penknife. It ought to look like this if NIV editors put out the truth. That's what their Bible would look like. Because that's what they ripped out of your Bible if you have an NIV. You don't have a Bible. Any of you notice the little banner back there? Has a King James Bible wearing a crown. And then you look underneath it, you'll see a pile of junk, including the NIV. And then over here is a banner brought to you 
by the gracious donation of a couple who got married and forgot to hang it up during their wedding. <laughs> so they donated it. The monarch of the books. King James. Look at that garbage it's tromping right there. Stomping on that stuff. It includes the NIV. Why? Because, folks, listen, there might be somebody watching this who, who just is fighting the reality, but your NIV, your new uh, American Standard, your English Standard Version, your new King James, all these new versions are garbage. Amen. They're producing the dead apostate churches. All of us have friends and relatives who spiritually are like a dumb as a rock Amen. because they're using bad Bibles. And they will never grow when they have their faith destroyed with that stuff. And the NIV is not alone. Other Vatican versions do this. This is the ESV. Same thing. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. No mention of the author, who is Daniel. And my favorites, from the translation consultant of the mess edge, uh, we get this. This is how the message goes. And I already told you, I mean, this guy had to have written the message. Here it is. <laughs> this is the message. Mark 13, 14 in the message. Alright? But be ready to run for it when you see the monster of desecration set up where it should never be. You who can read, <laughs> make sure you understand what I'm talking about. Doesn't that what, isn't that what it sounds like? That is awesome. <laughs> be ready to run for it. <laughs> yeah, be ready to run for it. Did I ever tell you the story of a guy? He's, this guy it was a revival meeting in Chicago, and a preacher, a friend of mine, he's up there preaching, getting ready to preach, but this was the kind of church where pretty much anybody could stand up and talk and give a testimony, and they'd actually preach a sermonette. And this guy gets up, and he runs up there, and he's got a big old Bible like mine, only it's a big white Bible, family Bible, and he's got a tie that comes about right here, and he comes walking up there, and he reads something that didn't have anything to do with anything he said, and then he says, I believe the Lord's coming soon. Everybody says, Amen. He says, and I don't know about you, but I'm getting my kids, and I'm packing my bags, and I'm going to Chicago. And he, he went running off. He left. And that preacher got up after him. He says, what? Why is he going to Chicago? And everybody's out there saying, we have no idea where he's going to Chicago. <laughs> huh? Uh, it must be. That's how crazy it's getting, folks. Of course, uh, the New Living Trans comes off a little more sophisticated than that. Uh, how do you know the New Living Trans is? The New Living Trans bio? It's a New Living Translation. <laughs> But um, this and this in uh, Mark 13, 14. The day is coming when you will see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing where he should not be. Reader, pay attention. Uh, it just cracks me up reading this stuff. Whew. Yeah, they change it just for the sake of change it so they get a copyright. That's what it's all about. Money. Love of money. So we repeat, the author of the book of Daniel is? Daniel. According to who? Jesus. And that settles it. Is that why it's called Daniel? That is. Yeah. I think they wrestled over the title, but they finally landed on Daniel. <laughs> Jehoiakim's rejection of God's word and wisdom led to these other sins. Idolatry. Like every good liberal, he believed in killing babies. Right. Liberals don't believe the Bible, and they pervert the Constitution. That's what they do. High taxation, like every good liberal, they're thieves. Take all your money, and what do they do? They waste it. And he built all kinds of things that didn't have any real purpose, government buildings and all that stuff. And then he murdered the prophet Uriah, and that's where liberalism, which is socialism, will end in your death. Eventually, if the socialists take over, they'll kill the Christians. They always do. And that's Jehoiakim's sins, that's just a partial list, but it's because of his attitude about the Word of God. 
And when you see all this stuff going on in the world, you're looking at people, you're seeing a culture that has kicked God out and they do not believe the book. Reality check. Jehoiakim represents the utter apostasy of Israel. He's kind of like the spokesman of apostasy. And resulted in the following. In verse 1 it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah came who? King of where? Babylon. Unto Jerusalem. And besieged it. Amen. Now, this uh, Babylonian captivity was accomplished over about a 20 year period. So you need to think in your head. And it's... Uh, begins uh, here and there were three waves basically. Um, we could call it the Nebuchadnezzar's 20 year war on Israel. Started in 606 BC, this besieged city. But they just took a group, they didn't take everybody, they, it was, but they, they left the city intact. But there was a rebellion and in 598 then came a major destruction and some more people taken to Babylon. And then in 586 was the total devastation and that's when the temple was totally destroyed and they, there was only a, a few people left in Israel. God left enough people to where they could keep it from becoming totally overgrown and it, it kind of laid the seed plant for 70 years later when they went back. But that's how it all happened. went down about 20 years time. Yes, that's when the yes uh, we, when we're later on we're going to see that uh, Daniel will read Jeremiah and he'll understand that how long this captivity is going to last and so forth and that's when it began in 586. Now Nebuchadnezzar's name means Nabu, preserve my firstborn son. Nabu, <laughs> it's actually a cute name. <laughs> Nabu, I mean, but. Nabu was the god of secular and occult education. So they're saying this god of secular and occult education preserve my firstborn son. And I'll just say, think about that one because education has become a god in America. And uh, everybody says it's like a religious thing. It's like being born again. If you have a degree, you're a success. And kids, your parents may tell you to not listen to me afterwards when you're going home, but if you're just getting a degree without any intention of actually using it for something, you're wasting your money. You're not being a good steward. And now, there are some cases, Charlie, where you can go get something that was kind of a waste of time in a lot of ways, but it still can benefit you. But if you do it the way Charlie did, he didn't go into debt. Amen. Good job. See? What is, so if you want to go to college and get a degree in watercolor ponies, and it's not going to cost a lot, more power to you. But if you're going off like a lot of kids are spending $100,000 for a degree in psychology. I'm sorry, but you need a psychologist if you do that. Number one, there's, there's only about one-third of psychology graduates can even get a job as a psychologist. So two-thirds are totally wasting their time. But psychology itself is a scam, so we'll just move on. But uh, there's, a, there's a small number of people who actually need some kind of psychology or whatever, but uh, I can't get into all that tonight. But anyway, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So the Lord is behind this. Amen. Why? That's why you know America's days are numbered. God punishes apostasy. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. Think of that. Which he carried into the land of Shinar. So Shinar is first mentioned in Genesis 10.10. 10. And take note of this. It's important to remember when you see Shinar in the Bible, it's the region where Babylon began and grew into a world power. You'll find that useful information as you read through the Bible. There's times when you're reading that and you'll see Shinar and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. That's off a quinky dinky. <laughs> yeah, it's in the Ur of the Chaldees, and that's where the Chaldeans got their name. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar. Look, 
to the house of his God, small g, that's Nebuchadnezzar's God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God, small g. House of his God, just remember this, it'll change as we continue to study Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. That's going to change. We also see those vessels again in chapter 5 with Belshazzar. Because he's weighed in the balance and found wanted. Yeah, you'll get more of that later. There's more where that came from. And the king spake unto Ashpedaz, the master of his what? It's amazing to me how people try to dance around this stuff. And I've heard people say, well, I don't think it really meant literally. No, it meant literally. And it's no joke. This tells us exactly why Daniel never marries and has any children. Jesus explains in Matthew 19, 12. Jesus said, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. That's Daniel. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Now, uh, it is true that there are some who are declared eunuchs and they're kind of like what we call confirmed bachelors so that they can stay single for the kingdom like Paul. But when they're made eunuchs of men, that means the men did something to them to make them a eunuch. And that is what we'd call castration. Now, I'm just going to be blunt with you. One of the reasons was is so they, th they could have these slave boys around their women and not have to worry about anything going on. That's it. You know? So, that's what was behind it. Notice who it is that Nebuchadnezzar chooses to turn into his eunuchs. Certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. You saw where Daniel and uh, Hananiah and uh, Azariah and Mishael, that's their names. We don't know them very well, but that's their real names. They were of the tribe of what? Judah. Why? All the kings had to be of Judah. See? It's important information. I hope you're getting it. And even more amazing, this event was prophesied by Isaiah. There's only eight verses. We're going to read this real quick. Isaiah chapter 39. Because I find this amazing. I find it fascinating that Isaiah prophesied what we're reading about in Daniel. Just like Jeremiah prophesied the destruction of Jehoiakim, Isaiah prophesies about Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael. So I'm going to read the odd and you read the even beginning of verse 1. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto them, him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons, that's because he's from Judah, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be what? Eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. 
He said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. Now that's a little self-centered. <laughs> well, you know, sorry boys, you're all going to get taken away and turned into eunuchs, but hey, it's good, because I'm going to die happy. That's what Hezekiah basically said. But do you see that? Isaiah prophesied exactly what we're reading, what we're studying here in Daniel, that this would happen. That book is amazing, folks. book is amazing. Verse 4 says, Children, talking about these children, in whom is no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding what? Science. Remember that. And such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, meaning that they were capable. They weren't... Um, uh, like unable to uh, function, you know. Yeah, they were pretty, um, you know, because not everybody can handle that kind of pressure. And whom they um, might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So they, they could tell that these are bright kids and they could pick up on the new language. Listen for the missing note again. The NIV, the ESV, the so-called New King James, which isn't a King James at all, the mess and the new trans. <laughs> Daniel 1 4. All remove what? Science? They all remove that word science. Someone doesn't want you to connect modern science with who believed in evolution. That's what it's all about. You'll find Freudian. Psychology that I mentioned a moment ago was based on the idea that we're all a bunch of sex perverts. It is a pagan load of nonsense that found its origin in the pagan religions of Babylon. And those pagan religions were all about sex and procreation. And if you want to see a real good example of it, just look at what's going on in the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. It's a sex cult, most of it done in private. And look what's going on in the Masonic Lodges, which is all about the generated uh, principle, the generative principle, the G in their little ring and their symbol. And on and on I could go with that if we had more time. That's why they took that word out of that verse in the new versions. Paul explains it in 1 Timothy 6.20. He said, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoid profane and vain battlings, and oppositions of what? Science. Falsely so called. See? I'll uh, just chew on that a little while. Take it home with you. And we're going to leave off by introducing Daniel and his, his, his three friends. Verse 5 And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And we're going to come back. That's where we're going to pick up next week, right here in this verse. But I want to introduce, um, when we start next week in verse 5, I want to close with, by reading verse 6. It says, Now among these were the children of Judah. See? The king's sons and the princes. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And as I've demonstrated tonight, I still have trouble remembering their real names. Because uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego. But I would encourage you to try to remember their given names, their original names, and we'll talk more about that in our future studies. The name of Daniel means God is my judge. That's scary unless you're saved. <laughs> and Daniel and friends, we know very little about these young men. They're in their late teens when they go to Babylon. We know very little about them except what we will read in our future studies here in the book of Daniel but we are going to see that they were amazing young men. And young men, young women, you all can be just as amazing because all they did was obey the Lord. That's all they did. So our next study will pick up in verse 5 and we're going to call it with a question mark. The Daniel Diet? <laughs> <laughs>